History and Freedom by Theodore Adorno, Lecture 12. Um, The Principle of Nationality, December 17th, 1964. Last time I started to tell you about the role of the nation in the construction of history. In view of the complexities of that concept, it seems only right that I should summarize what I said then in a more succinct and hopefully more authoritative form, and at the same time, make a few additional points. We may say that the nation is the specifically bourgeois form of social organization. It is a form of organization because it has emerged historically in certain definite units, whether geographical or linguistic in nature, or whether otherwise defined. It does not simply exist, but has had to fight to establish itself in the course of historical struggles. In accordance with the economic principles governing bourgeois society, this form of organization has perfected itself today in the late phase of bourgeois society. Nations, or many nations, are transforming themselves, or have done so at particular stages of history, into something like huge companies, vast economic entities, and remain like that even if free trade tendencies may temporarily mitigate their strict organization, outwardly at least. These massive concerns, which today could be said to be characterized by common values and by internal currencies, are the ultimate stage of this process. They may even be said to go one step further, since traditional national frontiers are to some extent ignored. If we regard nations as a form of organization appropriate to the rational constitution of bourgeois society, viewed as an economic system, this implies that they replace natural forms of association, which are then all brought together in the modern nation. Moreover, sacrifices are imposed on these natural associations, since nations, because of their size, no longer possess transparent links to individual interests, while in smaller social forms, in other words, feudal or smaller city-states, this relationship was rather more transparent, at least for the actual representatives of the economy. This statement, too, needs some historical qualification, but it can stand if you take it cum grano salis, without our being crucified by the economists. The nation developed everywhere through a struggle against feudalism. Feudalism was a world historical force, but because of its basis in the family, it was an essentially natural form of organization. People cling to these natural bonds, and to part from them always costs us an effort. Just think back to what the first day at school costs a child who has been brought up sheltered by his family. And you will be able to imagine what a nation expects from such natural associations. Thus, by retreating from these natural bonds, the nation also suppresses them, even though it takes over some of their features, and this forces it to act as if it were itself a natural form of society. And this is the primal pseudos, the primal delusion implicit in the concept of the nation, and which then finds expression in those ideologies of national spirit that I have already criticized in connection with the Hegelian texts, as you may recollect. In consequence, from the very outset, and by no means as late as the so-called age of Romanticism, but as early as certain writers of the 16th century, the idea of the nation has possessed what today we would call a romantic element that culminates in the delusions of racism. The delusion is that a form of association that is essentially dynamic, economic, and historical, misunderstands itself as a natural formation, or misconstrues itself ideologically as natural. This culminates in a belief in races, even though it is perfectly plain that under fascism the national groups that have imagined themselves to be defined by race have long since ceased to be so. I believe that these arguments make clear that this delusion, this fiction, strictly applies to the historical dynamic that is implicit in the concept of the nation, It is not sufficient, or rather it is too easy to talk about the delusions of racism and to denounce them.
What counts here is the ability to explain it and to recognize its place in the dynamics of history. I believe that only by doing so, only by uncovering the historical roots of racism, does it, be does it become possible to escape the persistent habits of thought associated with it. It is a delusion in a strict sense of the word. Mind has become estranged from nature and even from itself, so that in this situation racism represents the mind's compensation for what has been done to it, for the nature that has been suppressed in it. This nature then reappears in perverse form, namely as fiction, and in that guise it necessarily assumes the destructive qualities that we have seen in nationalism throughout its entire history from the end of the 18th century and through the 19th, passing through imperialism until it reached its apogee in fascism. We may say then that the concept of the nation gives us an insight into the mechanisms that Freud analyzed on the level of individual psychology in his book, Civilization and Its Discontents. Only here they appear as collective powers or as achievements of the collective unconscious, if I may for once be permitted to use this expression. In the concept of the nation, repressed nature is mobilized in the interests of a progressive domination of nature, progressive rationality, <clears throat> and as a regressive phenomenon. That is to say, as a return to something already rendered obsolete. It is just as contaminated by that as it is by its untruth, which compels it constantly to gloss over its feelings and exaggerate its virtues. Precisely because the nation is not nature, it is ceaselessly to proclaim its closeness, closeness to nature, its immediacy and the intrinsic value of the national community. Things have not always been thus, and I believe that it is important for me to add this. There have been periods when the nation had a highly progressive function. If it had not done so, if the populations and all other important interested parties had not benefited hugely from the national form of organization of bourgeois society, then the sheer tenacity of the idea of the nation, even in an age when its feelings are as obvious as they are at present, would be completely incomprehensible. I need only remind you how much the development of communications, and hence of the forces of production in general, was advanced by the collapse of the barriers erected by the small feudal monarchies, the states generally referred to under absolutism as petty principalities. I need only remind you that it is that it was only with the creation of modern nation states that something like a universal legal system was established. For example, that of safe conduct and the like. And above all, that it was only that it was only by bringing large territory that it was only by bringing large territories together and combining them into a single political unit that it became possible to organize large bodies of people in a rational manner and in harmony with the principle of exchange. For previously, under the feudal system, groups of people were only loosely connected with one another and in those circumstances could not be welded together into the totality of a bourgeois society. It is difficult to overestimate these achievements on the part of the nation-state as contrasted with feudalism, and it is certainly no coincidence that it is the nation-state that has witnessed the great achievements of technology, the great technological inventions. Lastly, lastly, we should note that this progressive side of the nation, if I can call it that, extends to its cultural life. That is to say, in its earliest stages, at least, the truly free and great intellectual achievements of modern bourgeois society were all linked to the origins of national consciousness and the creation of nation states. Above all, this holds good for the creation of a national language. The most famous instance of this is, of course, Dante. But we could no doubt say the same thing of Chaucer in English literature, and in Germany the Luther Bible probably had a similar function, although these are chicken and egg situations, in which it is not clear whether the national language and hence the national consciousness are the creations of those great intellectual structures or whether, as seems to me to be more likely, the historical development of the mind had reached a point where it could be crystallized in the great linguistic monuments which made use of a national language. <clears throat>
We can say that even as late as Herder, I believe I may have said this to you already, the concept of humanity and the emergence of the principle of nationality go hand in hand. It would be an interesting and rewarding task sociologically and philosophically to analyze this in Herder's case. But then, around the time of the political victory of the bourgeoisie over absolutism, something happened. At the same time as the curbing of absolutism blunted the last vestige of feudalism still surviving into the bourgeois era, nationality turned into that truly pernicious, destructive phenomenon that we have come to experience. This change was already visible to Franz Grillparzer, a poet of moderate views, wholly innocent of any political radicalism. His attitude was summed up in that dictum that I hope is known to all of you to the effect that the historical process leads from humanity via nationality to bestiality. At this juncture, Hegel represents something of a watershed. I believe that, now that we are studying Hegel's philosophy of history, we would do well to look closely at those passages that make it clear that Hegel had more in common with totalitarianism than one might have imagined, but which also show that he still exhibits the features of bourgeois liberalism. I should like to read you a passage in this connection, which goes as follows. The naturalness of spirit progresses into the further particularization of these racial differences, and so falls apart into the multiplicity of local and national spirits. The concept of race occurs frequently, and likewise the reference to his belief in the difficulty in modifying nationality, something he regards as a natural given without seriously inquiring into the mechanism that enables a national consciousness to persist, even when it has been rendered obsolete by history. This is one of the moments in which we might almost say that the dialectical philosopher lapses naively into static ways of thinking. In this connection, he says, and this is extremely interesting, we shall have to discuss it in some detail, that the spirits of the people, or national spirits, I'm quoting this verbatim, belong partly to the natural history of man, and partly to the philosophy of world history. I should like to bring to your attention, we shall probably come back to it after the holidays, when we shall discuss it in greater depth, but I do not want it to be overlooked. The fact that precisely this concept of natural history, which Hegel introduces so emphatically in connection with the principle of nationality, is then taken up by Marx, although in a radically altered form, as is so often the case with Marx's adoption of Hegelian concepts. I should also add, in the interests of philological accuracy, that generally speaking, natural history was not used in the precise sense that I intend it to have, to have and what I shall be saying to you. Rather, in this older usage, natural histo history really meant no more than nature study, but the very fact that nature is somehow regarded as having a history, presumably a legacy of the Baroque period, is highly significant, and hence we shall have to insist on the point. As early as Hegel, then, we find this tendency to stabilize things that have been rendered obsolete by the passage of time, and, if possible, to restore them. And the later Hegel had a, had a strong inclination to intervene in threatened and obsolete situations, with a view to restoring them by converting them into ahistorical constants. Looked at historically, such constants are always regarded as natural. It is then simply from this functional point of view, without regard to any truth content it might have, that we have to view his use of the ethnologically untenable concept of race. Today, the situation is completely different, and this brings me back to matters that I alluded to last time in connection with my observation in the Weltliner Keller in Zurich. This was that with Hegel. This was that while Hegel had some justification for speaking of the substantial nature of the national in his day, the nation has now been reduced to a mere facade by the uniformity of the organization of life on an international plane. If you have the opportunity to fly long distances and to see, just to mention the most obvious fact, how all over the world airports resemble one another, by which I mean the entire business of loudspeakers, hostesses, and everything that goes with them, you will indeed find it hard to resist the impression that other differences between individual towns exist largely only to motivate passengers to travel from one to the other, from Karachi to Naples or elsewhere. But for this marketing interest, what these airports all symbolize would be taken further, 
to the point where the cities they serve would likewise be ruthlessly, I almost said buried beneath it. In that event, the forms of human existence, which even now provide us with only an illusory sense of diversity, would plainly exhibit the fundamental equality of the exchange principle which dominates our lives. I should like to emphasize that I do not believe that we are dealing here with a superficial phenomenon of external trappings. In other words, that the airports may all be the same, while the lives led by the peoples are notable for their great diversity, I believe that for you, simply to play down the force of these examples would be to mistake the situation. The contrary is the case. The phenomena I am highlighting here as illustrating a historical insight simply point to the fact that the modes of production, namely the primacy of industry, have come to prevail throughout the world, and that wherever this principle obtains, both in practical terms and as far as its marketing value is concerned, these uniformities will emerge. In other words, and this is what we must say by way of criticism of Hegel, it is no longer the case that so-called cosmopolitanism is the more abstract thing in contrast to the individual nations. Cosmopolitanism now possesses the greater reality. Um, we can now see a convergence in countless spheres of life and forms of production, right down to clothing and all sorts of other things that are all based on American models. This convergence points to the convergence of the fundamental processes of life. In other words, the dominance of industrial production. Compared with this, the differences between nations are merely rudimentary vestiges. So what we are seeing is a change of quantity into quality. At this point, Hegel can be said to be in the right against Hegel insofar as in the sphere of nations, the national spirits, which in his writings have the status of a principle, are conceived to be eternal, although he might well have asked himself whether the supply of nations might, ne might not be all too rapidly exhausted, given that nations only have their turn when the previous incumbents have been slaughtered. By a qualitative change, I mean that the theory of history in terms of national spirits is now outdated. It is no longer possible to say that the world spirit inhabits a particular nation, as Hegel could in his day. For example, when we once caught sight of Napoleon and imagined that he could see the world, world soul on horseback, in other words, in the shape of the specifically imperialist French national spirit of 1806. History itself, then, has put paid to what Hegel imagined was a timeless principle. Hegel and even Spengler still believed that the world's spirit passed the torch from one nation to the next. But I should like to add that one of the factors responsible for the gloomy outlook for the present age is that we can now see that there is something amiss with this belief. Incidentally, there are passages in Hegel where he prophesies that one day the Slav nations will take their turn in this system, which he persists in basing on the model of ruling and being ruled. Now, if this principle were to be perpetuated by the triumph of the Slav peoples, this would not be saying too much in favor of the world spirit, which is supposed to have become conscious of itself. So today the task is not simply to conserve the concrete essence of human relations, and the transitory form of the different nations, which incidentally has long since been unmasked as fraudulent, but to bring about this concrete state of human community on a higher, higher plane. And by a superior state, I do not mean a mechanical union of superpowers joined together in even more gigantic blocks. This would, if anything, just worsen the disaster. What I have in mind is something that would change the form of society itself, and put an end to the abstract organization that acts so repressively towards its members. This is by no means as utopian as it sounds on first hearing, if only because modern technology already opens up the possibility of decentralization that actually makes it unnecessary to bring societies together in gigantic, hierarchical entities. This means that the historical form of, the, of progressive rational, rationalization has ceased to be the most rational way of of doing things, and it survives only in the interests of the existing relations of production. In the meantime, however, it would already be possible to organize societies far more rationally in much smaller units that could collaborate peaceably with one another, and from which all those aggressive and destructive tendencies would have been banished.
but oddly enough, it is precisely the technical advances towards decentralization that have been neglected. What we see in their place is the fetishization of the concept of the nation. I have already said something to you about this. We may say that the fetishism of the nation is especially highly developed in countries where nation building was a failure. This is particularly true of Germany. As you know, in Germany, unlike France and Britain, the conflict between the vassals, in other words, the representatives of feudal power, and the centralizing head of state was never fully resolved. That failure was traditionally embodied in the collapse of the Holy Roman Empire at the turn of the 19th century. The concept of nation has always had its precarious and repressive aspects, both internally and externally, but the fact that the Germans never succeeded in creating a, na a nation turned that concept into a trauma. In a specific sense, we can say that National Socialism represented an extremely belated catching up with the organizational form of the nation. The power that National Socialism possessed over people in Germany was probably connected with the fact that the Nazis had achieved something that had previously been thwarted in Germany, and that had been a traumatic experience for so many people. But in Germany, just as the bourgeois revolution came too late, so too did the process of nation-building linked to the principle of the bourgeois revolution. This belated arrival was no less fatal for National Socialism, since it, since it endowed that movement with the particular and terrible qualities that occur in history whenever, as Hegel puts it, something is abandoned by the world spirit. It is very similar to the way in which the witches' trials occurred not at the time when Thomism was flourishing, but during the period of the Counter-Reformation, when the ancient organization of the church had been shaken and its recovery problematic. I believe, then, that you must think of the specific case of German nationalism, and no doubt also its virulent nature, as the product of a failed process of nation-building and of its productive function, both matters associated with its belated arrival on the world stage. To return to Hegel, the concept of the nation always has the propensity to belittle the individual in comparison to the universal, and then to defame him. When Hegel establishes the nation as the connecting link between the individual and the objective or universal configuration in which the national spirit manifests itself, he does so chiefly because the concept provides a splendid ideological handle with which to reinforce the predominance of the universal as it existed in pre-individual, repressive ages before the category of the individual had come into being and the blind rule of the collective prevailed. However, this concept of nation is no longer compatible with Hegel's own doctrine of progress and the consciousness of freedom. And even in Hegel's own day, it already belonged in the realm of ideology. In this context, we should remind ourselves of Hegel's famous eulogies of war and the philosophy of right. These eulogies were heavily exploited by the National Socialists, and I believe they were the only Hegelian propositions that were popular under Hitler. Their lesson is that, while Hegel believed that in the state antagonisms were, if not eliminated, at least tamed, in his glorification of the concept of the nation, the elements of antagonism and repression did break through to the surface against his own intentions on his cult of war, or in his cult of war. The national spirits, the nations, are fundamentally inured to reason, and to that extent they are incompatible with Hegel's own doctrine of progress and the consciousness of freedom. They are anachronisms, unless we go so far, and Hegel is himself not above the suspicion that he has gone so far on occasion, as to sever all links between the spirit or the world spirit and actual human reason, and individual reason, and to hypostasize them. When discussing Hegel in the course of these lectures, I have often praised him for emphasizing the logic of the whole, the not without cause, the necessary chain of reasoning, as opposed to merely subjective individual reasoning. I have suggested that there is something remarkably progressive and magnificent about this. And what is magnificent is his insight into the context of guilt, or the web of delusion characteristic of society as a whole. However, we must add that this complete separation of the concept of spirit as an objective reality from every form of subjective reason, in other words, the absolute hypostasization of this objective logic of things, 
as opposed to the sensuous actuality of the course of history as it is enacted by individual human beings, becomes in Hegel a means of justification, a way of justifying and finding excuses for things that are absolutely rational and lacking in spirit. The tenor of what I have been saying up to now is that in Hegel the path of the world's spirit seems to resemble nothing so much as a terrible entrapment, a kind of infernal machine. You will rightly be asking yourselves and looking to me for an answer to the question of how it was possible for Hegel, who was by no, by no means blind and who spoke as cuttingly of the horrors of the course of history as apart from him only Schopenhauer could, how it was possible for him, despite all that, to end up glorifying history. Now we have reached the point where you have the answer, or so I should like to think. What he does is to split the logic of the course of history, that is to say the rationality of the necessity of development from one event to the next, from any confrontation with individual human reason, even though it is in that reason that all judgments about the, about the rationality or irrationality of the whole have their roots. This enables him to disregard the rationality of individuals, in other words, the rational interests of individu individual human beings. Instead, he can proclaim as positively rational the intractable tangle of historical events and processes that is actually at loggerheads with the legitimate rationality of individual human beings. I would say that this is the starting point from which to construct systematically a philosophy of history that would be prevented by its own logic from sliding into ideology or making concessions to any ideology, ideology alien to it. However, this can only be achieved at the price that a concept of spirit that dispenses with any justification before the bar of reason thereby ceases to be comprehensible as spirit. This is similar to the way in which Hegel's concept of this subject, this too is a concept that runs through the entire Hegelian system, how his concept of the subject thinks of itself as being an absolutely objective thing over and above the actual subject. In other words, he thinks of it as an absolute that rises above the subjectivity of individual human beings. This procedure enables this subjectivism that has made itself absolute to oppress the individual historical subjects and to oppose them. We can also turn this around and say that Hegel's entire theory is based on a distinction between natural elements and historical elements, but that in the final analysis, it fits in with the concept of natural history that he himself promulgated. And that brings me to a discussion of the concept of natural history, with which I should like to begin in the second half of the semester, and which will then lead us on to the problem of freedom.